Yeah, let's just stay here just for a second more. Keep playing, keep playing. Mm, give me Jesus. How I worship you, how I own you. There's no one else like you, Lord. Praise you. Yeah, I know I am. Yeah, just close your eyes. Forget about the person to your right, your left. Yeah, just forget yourself now and just tell them how much you love them. Yeah, just lift your hands and love them. Or how I love you, how I long for you, how there's no one else like you. How worthy you are. important for us to always remember the gospel. I was riding with Reinhard Bunke many years ago in a car, and I asked him one day, I said, why do you only preach the gospel? And he says that God told him to never leave the ABCs. And it bothered me in those days because I was only interested really in D through Z. But I realized he was showing me the secret to genuine spirituality. You move on in the Christian life by not moving on. Yes. You stay right in the center of this wonderful gospel. Yeah. You stay right there and you let that cause increase in growth, even as Paul says, as you received him, so walk in him. Yeah. Amen. How did you receive him? Well, you came bankrupt and empty, a yeah. sinner, and cast yourself upon him and yeah. said, Lord, please That's have right. mercy on me. Did you not? That's right. As you received him, so walk in him. Amen. Sometimes we want to move past needing God. Yes, we do. Sometimes we want a wand to be waved over our lives, and then he instantaneously delivers us from everything so we don't have to need him anymore. Do you notice that? That's how we are. But the way the gospel works is that it brand new every day saves you again. Yes, the Christian life seems to be 10,000 savings. Wow. Thank you, Lord. He just continually comes and he rescues yeah. you like a knight in shining armor again. And again and again. Praise God it's that way. Because then all the glory belongs to him. And he's the one who not only picked you up, he cleans you off and he keeps you standing. Praise God. It must rest upon him because if he does half the work, then he's only worthy of half the glory. But if he does all the work, then he's worthy of all the glory. So we cast ourselves upon him today. I just want to remind you a couple of things about this nature of Jesus Christ. A friend of mine likes to say the things about you that make you cringe most. Make him hug Titus. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Yes. He goes into your deepest shame and he dissolves it with deepest love. Yes, thank you. This is what our God does. And he has such a gentle and tender heart towards you. Yes. And that he walks you through <clears throat> life himself. Mm -hmm. By his own preciousness, he takes your attention and steals away all your affection. 
And with love, he raptures your heart. R-A-P-T. He wraps up. He takes you up. So that even though you're in the world, you're not of the world. <laughs> and even though you're in the world, you have delights from another world. You get to taste the world to come, even while in this world, through the gospel. And it's not because you're good enough, because I got news for you, and I'll save you the suspense. You're not good enough, nor will you ever be good enough. That's the wonder of this great gospel man, Jesus the Christ. I want to remind you today of the wonderful gospel. The, the name of this message today is the beauty of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, the reason why I want to talk to you about the beauty of Jesus Christ is because I find that the more I see his beauty, the more my heart is taken with him. Yeah. But I find that the less I look at his beauty, the less my heart is taken with him. Mm. And how important is it for our hearts to be taken with him? Well, if your heart is not taken with him, then he doesn't have you. That's right. But when God has the heart, he has the man. Amen. And the way that he steals your heart is by showing you his splendor. Amen. He just shows him. He doesn't force you. He doesn't trap you in a corner to try to collect your consent. Right. What he does is he shows his wonderful beauty to you. And he says, here I am if you'd like to follow me. Yes, and then like Matthew, you can leave everything, get up and follow him. Isn't yeah. it interesting how the scripture says that? Yeah. In other words, he left everything before he even stood up to follow the Lord. Because it's something that happens right in the year. Yeah. Right, yes. And when those beautiful eyes look in your face and say, follow me, there's only one response. I'm leaving everything right. and I will follow you, Lord. Yeah. To the day that I die, I will follow you. Mm. Will there be trips and will there be difficulties and will there be windings in the road? Will there be enemies? Will there be wolves? Absolutely. But you have a good shepherd. Yeah. And a faithful shepherd. And we, have, we must have more faith in his ability to lead than our ability to follow. Yeah. And so we look to the Lamb of God who is also a shepherd. And he protects us and he guides us and he keeps us. Praise God. Our only job is to keep our eyes upon him. And there he will lead us and, and he will guide us. The text that I want to look at today is in Colossians if you want to take a look at it. To look at the beauty of Jesus Christ. There's a word that I really love. It's called, the word is lovely. How many of you have ever thought of this word before? Lovely. Maybe you see a, something in your life. You say, oh, that's lovely. To, to make you understand why people call Christ lovely, you have to understand the definition of the word lovely. The word lovely means able to excite affection. So when you say Jesus is lovely, it means when you see him as he is, he excites affection. The internals, the affections of your heart literally get jarred to life when you actually see Christ as he is. So Jesus is altogether lovely as the psalmist or the, 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 the son of the psalmist says. <laughs> altogether lovely, meaning everything about him is exciting your affections That's right. so if you're bored with the lord then somewhere you're not seeing him rightly That's right, man. That's because right. he excites affections when you see him rightly That's right. so this is why the plan of the enemy revealed to us in in corinthians 4 4 it says this that the the god of this world blinds mm -hmm. the minds from seeing the glories of christ the whole entire setup of the world and the thinking pattern of this life yeah. is to stop you from seeing him rightly. That's right. Because the devil knows if you see him rightly, you'll be stolen away. That's right. He knows Amen. if you see him as he in fact is Amen. the beauty of the Lord. Beauty is attraction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it used to bother me sometimes when people would say, or in the early days, people would say, Jesus is beautiful. I'd say, what does that even mean? Because I'm, I'm a man, I think, like, I know what a beautiful woman looks like. I know what that feels like. You see a beautiful woman, you're like, I'm attracted to that. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. But when you say Jesus is beautiful, I don't get it. It used to bother me. And so I began to really ask the Lord, show me what this means. And the Lord began to show me that when you see his gentleness, his tenderness, his faithfulness, his justice, all his perfect characters, balanced, completely symmetry of perfections, when you see what he's really like, 
That causes the soul to be attracted to Him, pulled towards Him. That's beauty. The beauty of the Lord is Himself. I've been reading the diary of David Brainerd recently. He's a missionary to the American Indians. He died at the age of 29 of tuberculosis. And one of his last journal entries, and I love biographies, and I love to get to the end of their life and see what their conclusion thoughts are. Uh, last night I shared about Andrew Murray's conclusion thoughts. Tonight, I'll, uh, Today I'll tell you about David Brainer's conclusion thoughts. The last journal entry he has, the last line says this, Oh, that men would love him for himself alone. Not what he can do, not what he gives, praise God for all those things, and we receive them gladly and we enjoy them because we love what he wants to give to us in his love. But more than all the things he does, it's who he is that steals the heart away. And, and this in and of itself is enough to keep the soul preoccupied for eternity. As a matter of fact, in the ages to come, the preoccupation will be with God. Does that mean we're only going to worship all day? No, worship has many forms. So yes, we will sing unto the Lord, but we shall also serve the Lord yeah. with gladness. Yeah. And one of the things Brainerd keeps saying in his diary when he knows he's dying is, I can't wait to serve God without being inhibited in any way. Because wow. he says that in his physical body, he's, he's inhibited. He's, he can't serve the Lord completely with every second of every moment. Because he's got to sleep, he's got to eat, you know, these things. But he wants to completely give himself fully. And he says, when I die, then I'll be re released from the restrictions of giving him the kind of glory and service that he deserves. He's longing for it. So I say this to say the beauty of Jesus is what I want to talk about just for a few minutes. And I'm praying, God, that the Holy Ghost would stimulate your brain. And you would, you would see and hear the words that are coming out of this pulpit today and from the scriptures. And you would say, I want a fresh vision of my Jesus. Because in seeing him, he literally steals away all other desires. He is the fulfillment of all desires. And so you begin to find the other things that you want begin to dissolve when you realize you have him. A lot of us are moved by and swayed by things that we want. Desires not yet fulfilled on the inside of us. But when we realize him who's given to us, we see him and we experience him in his presence, we find that all the vacuums of the soul are shut up. And then all these wayward things don't have power anymore. Do you recognize that, there, that, that there's something in them that you would naturally want? Absolutely. But the pull is not there anymore because you are fulfilled. I mean, how... How often have you ever went to a buffet and you ate so much that you felt almost uncomfortably full? You know what I'm saying? And then somebody may bring to you the greatest smelling, greatest looking steak you have ever seen in your life. And they put it in front of you and you're going to throw up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're so full, you don't even want to look at food. Yeah. It's like we were out to eat the other night, my wife and I with an older couple we like to spend time with. Uh, they're in their 70s, and we just like to glean from them and listen to them and talk to them. And he was finished eating, but he didn't finish everything, and she wanted to take it home. And he, and he looks at her while she's putting it in a box, and then he goes, I don't ever want to see that again. <laughs> That's the kind of thing when Jesus fulfills your soul, the things that you used to desire and have such a taste for become repulsive to you. A satiated man loathes honey, the scripture says. Honey is sweet, but when you're satiated, when you're satisfied, even the thing that used to be so sweet to you loses its taste. Yeah. Praise God it's that way. Yes. David Brainerd also wrote, he said, an hour with God infinitely excels all the pleasures and delights of this lower world. Yes. Yes. Robert, Murray McShane, a calm, Robert Murray McShane said, a calm hour with God is worth a lifetime with any man. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Yes. Charles Spurgeon said, it is worthwhile to have lived, if for nothing, than to have had a half an hour's fellowship with God. That's beautiful, isn't it? When we see Jesus in his beauty and what he's really like, these are the kinds of desires that awaken on the inside. If you don't long to be alone with God, then I invite you to a fresh vision of who's asking you to be with him. To really see Jesus as he in fact is, the soul will lose its desires for other things. I'm not saying you can't, I'm not saying, you know, golfing means you don't know the Lord. You know, I'm not saying that. 
I'm saying that there is a preoccupation on the inside where you are so filled with God and so longing for God that even in the mundane things that you do throughout the day, there's a cry on the inside that says, oh, how I love you, Lord. You do, it, you do dishes to the glory of God. And not only you don't just use the Dawn soap, you wash them also with your tears <laughs> because your heart is going up unto God. And even in your hobbies, your hobbies are so much better because the presence of the Lord is with you and your mind is upon Him. I'm not trying to make us all monks and to sit in a, in a cave all day long and just think about the beauty of the Lord. I'm saying let's incorporate our souls unto God, like put our souls upon God in everything. See, there's an old Puritan proverb that says, if the sun does not shine, all the candles in the world won't make it day. Mm. And, and that is trying to tell us something. It's the problem of mankind. Men are lighting candles trying to find the light of the sun. Wow. You say, what are, what are the candles? Well, they light a friendship thinking they're going to find fulfillment in that. They get married. They think they're going to find fulfillment in that. They have children. They think they're going to find fulfillment in that. They get success or they look for money. And they're lighting all these candles trying to find the light of the sun. But they don't even realize that those things that they're lighting can be snuffed out with the slightest movement. But the sun that shines Whoa. consistent as the sun himself he is everlasting yeah. satisfaction, and he cannot be touched, nor there's any, is there anything to compare with him. As Charles Spurgeon said it like this. I love this imagery. He said, there isn't an item on the earth that transcends the smallest item in the heavens. Then he says, but there isn't an item in the heavens that transcends the smallest measure of Jesus. Oh, amen. He's trying to pull your mind up a little bit higher. He has set his glory above the heavens. And has called you to come and look at it and enjoy his presence. Praise God. I love this because in my, in my heart, I find that the, the beauty of holiness is literally holiness produced by his beauty. <laughs> You're looking at him, you find satisfaction in him and peace in him. See, the joys of the earth are as inconsistent as the earth, but the joys of heaven are as consistent as heaven itself. And you see that the joys of earth are like the earth. They're earthy. But the joys of Christ are like himself, heavenly. He who's from above, John the Baptist said, is above all. That's Christ who came down from heaven. And he who's from above is above all. And so is everything about him. His voice is greater than any other voice. His presence is greater than any other presence. His gifts are better than any other gifts. Amen. His sweetness is sweeter than anybody else. His kindness is unmatched. His patience is embarrassing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How often has the Lord had mercy upon you? Yes. Carl Barth said at the end of his life, they asked him, they said, what do you see when you look back over your life? He says, all I see is the forgiveness of sin. How much mercy has God had upon you? Sometimes we need to remember these things because what it does is it quickens an understanding of an attribute of God that should steal your love and cause you to fall in love with him. Colossians chapter one, we see this description of Jesus. It starts in verse 13. He is the image of the invisible God. I want you to notice something. The he is means he's currently. It's not that he was or he will be only he is currently in the time of writing. Jesus has died and resurrected already. And he says he is. Jesus currently right now is the image of the invisible God. It, it's interesting because we've all, we all have faith in God. I mean, the wind that blows across your face, the sun that shines throughout the day, the, mi the mighty mountains, the, the flowing rivers, the animals on the earth. We know that these things did not just occur we know they are the crafty hand of the intelligent god we know them to be this way the trees speak of his glory and we believe them is this not true yeah. but he's invisible to us and we can't see him but jesus is you can now see him <laughs> he is the image of the invisible one and this to me puts in the person of jesus christ all the mysteries and splendor and majesty of God in one person, Jesus Christ. Yes. So when you turn your eyes to Jesus, you are looking at God that can be seen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Yes. 
Because God is, as the old mystics used to say, he's apophatic, meaning he's too high and too beyond to be able to understand. You can't hold him down or, or grasp him. He's very difficult to understand because he's beyond comprehension. As the scripture says, his wisdom is unscrutable. You can't, you can't even search out his ways because he's so vast. But God, in his humility and kindness, not only does it, is it expressed in Psalm chapter 113 where he humbles himself to look upon the heavens and the earth, which is crazy to me. God humbles himself to give attention to the things going on in the heavens. He humbles himself to look upon the earth. It's an act of humility for God to give attention to you. And not only is it an act of humility for him to look at what's going on with the angels, but he looks down at the lowest, the poor of the poor on the planet. And he lifts him up from the beggar, from the dunghill. He pulls him up and makes him princes. This is God's wisdom. And so with this understanding, with this, this vastness, we see that God has in humility made his unknowableness knowable by becoming a man. And it, it goes on to say here that he is the firstborn of all creation. Now let me explain to you what this means. The, the term firstborn is an Old Testament understanding of the preeminent place. So if you had a bunch of sons, what, the, the firstborn had a preeminent status. He was above all the rest. He received all the inheritance. Are you following me? Yeah. So when it says Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, it means he is the supreme of all creation. Now, what it doesn't say is that Jesus is created. It says that he came into the things he created. <laughs> so God who created all things says, I want to communicate with my creation, so I'm going to drop down inside of my created things and become a man. And therefore, by virtue of the fact that God has entered into the things he created, he is the superior to all created things. That he is the firstborn of all creation. Praise God. And not only this, but it says, it says he created the things in the heavens and on the earth, visible and in the invisible. See, we couldn't, even, we couldn't even number all the things he's made that we can see. And yet there's unlimited amount of things that he's seen that made that we can't see. He's just so vast and so glorious. It goes on here that whether thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him. Check this out. Not only did he make them, but they're for him. This is incredible to me. He made them for himself. This is why when a man chooses to rule his own life, he's rebelling against the divine order. When you say, I'm going to make my own decisions. No, no, no. You were made by him for him. You rebel against the purpose of your existence when you choose to run your own life. Yeah. So when he says it's for him, as a matter of fact, in Revelation, it says for his pleasure, he created them. He delights to have you. And in this, when we refuse to follow his, his divine purpose, his divine plan, or as D.M. Panton said, he said, there's already been a, a, a drafted, uh, there's already been a draft of your life by God. It would do you good to live near the div divine original. Mm -hmm. So stay as close to what you know God desires for you as possible, because that's where glory comes in. Mm -hmm. So whether, whether things created, it says he is before all things and in him all things hold together, which is incredible. Literally the properties of gravity and things holy to it's, it's, it's him. Praise God. So it says here, he is also the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself. Mm -hmm. See, there's a main character in this story, and it's not you or I. Yeah. It's Jesus the Christ. Amen. And this main character means everything is about him and for him and by him and through him, from him are all things to him, are all things to him be all the glory. As a matter of fact, that, that comes from Romans chapter 11, the very last verse. It says, from him, to him, and through him are all things. And the very next verse says, therefore, because from him, to him, and through him are all things, therefore, because of that, lay your body down. Offer your body as a living sacrifice to him. This is a reasonable act of worship. In other words, it's the only thing that makes sense for you to do with your physical body is to give it to God. Lay it down. Why? Because from him, to him, and through him are all things. He's the main character. Praise God. And so I just, I point your eyes to these things because it's very important. And this is where I, I want to shift the gears. It says that through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth 
or things in heaven. You were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his flesh body, in his fleshly body through death in order to present you to himself holy and blameless and beyond reproach if indeed you continue firmly in the faith established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Are you following what I'm saying? I'm trying to call your minds up to this person who's so beautiful and so glorious and deserves all attention and deserves all love and adoration. He deserves all your energy, effort, time. He deserves it all because of who he is. And those that don't give it to him are those that do not recognize him as who he is. So who is this who holds the wind in his fist? Who sits in bliss and gives life by kisses? <laughs> he himself is called riches. This is the king of glory. Who bends his knee to feed thee. Bleeding, he freed thee. And in eating, he keeps thee. This is the king of glory. Praise God. So our Lord... We say to our Lord, it is our highest joy to preach thee and heaven on earth to seek thee. Yeah. Praise God. So I want to just point out to you that the beauty of the Lord is himself, his attributes. And he has two sides of these attributes. And this is where I'll close. On one side, you have the grandeur, splendor, and majesty of his greatness. And then on this side, you have the lowliness of becoming a man. On this side, you have the heights. And on this side, side, you have the depths. On this side of God, you have none higher. On this side, you have one that went so low, no one can go lower. This is the beauty of the Lord, that he who has scraped the highest heavens has scraped the depths of hell. There isn't one higher, there isn't one lower. We worship him because there's none higher. We love him because none has went lower. And when you look at this incredible symmetry of God, because as high as he is, that's as low as he went. He's at the highest point, and he went to the lowest point. Praise God. And that right there should steal our hearts away. I make it a point in my heart, in my life, every day to remember the gospel. I walk through the gospel to remember what Jesus has done for me. Because it's the gospel that makes me fall in love with Jesus. Some people say to me sometimes, they get so frustrated, and they say, you know, I want to love Jesus more. They're like, can you help me love Jesus more? What do I have to do to love Jesus more? Let me just tell you a wonderful verse in the scriptures. It says, we love him because he first loved us. Your love for Jesus cannot transcend your understanding of his love for you. So the more that you see his love for you, the more you'll fall in love with him. Are you following what I'm saying? So how do you see his love for you? Well, in this, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The ungodly. He died for the ungodly. And every ungodly part of your being, Jesus Christ took a beating so that you could be delivered from that thing which is killing you. See, we have a great need for Christ, but we have a great Christ for our need. And in the gospel, you stand before God as Christ because Christ stood before God as you. In the gospel, you have everything you need to fall head over heels in love with Jesus freshly every single day. So when you look at this heights of Jesus or, or the heights of God himself, we see that this grand vision of God, as Charles Spurgeon said, he said, A vision of God is the quietus of pride. Quietus is the finishing stroke. It's like it kills pride. When when what? When you see God as he is. A proud man is a man who has no view of God whatsoever. Remember C.S. Lewis said, he said, those that are always looking down on others cannot see him who's above them. See, when you see God as he is, the only thing to do is to lay down and say, I, as Job says, (laughs) <laughs> Think about this. Job's whole life is falling apart. And he goes to God and he says to God, what in the world is going on? Basically, is what he said. You know what God does? God doesn't even answer any of his questions. What he does is he shows him how glorious he is. And in showing him how glorious he is, this is Job's conclusion. I am insignificant. That's his, his, his point. <laughs> and God is trying to show him. Listen, there's... There is 
things that your human finite mind cannot understand, you, you trust me. That's where trust comes in. That's your link with God. It, never, it will never be understanding. Your link with God is not understanding. Your link with God is trust. And I remember reading a book by Gene Edwards many years ago. And at the end of the book, he says, are you willing to trust the God you do not understand? That's faith. I don't need to understand you. I see what your nature is, and I trust you. Are you following me? And so I just want to read a couple of things that it says about the heights of God, and then I'll tell you about the depths of God, and then we'll close out. Is that all right? Just give me maybe five more minutes. Is that okay? Okay. So we have the scriptures tell us a few incredible things. It says that all things are his servants. These are scriptures. Listen to this. All things are his servants. That right there is incredible. Number two, the scriptures tell us that he works, he works all things after the counsel of his own will. That's incredible to me. It makes me sit back and say, wow, I can trust the Lord. Yeah. You know what else it says? The scriptures show us that his sovereignty rules over all. And the scripture says that he sits in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. The scriptures are trying to show us an image of God. He is so far removed yes. and so high and so in control yes. that all you have to do is say, Lord, I trust in your plan. I trust in who you are. I don't need to understand. I trust you. Yes. This I'll brings believe. freedom into the soul, brings freedom into your heart. And even in the difficult times, you can put your hand over your mouth and say, I don't know. I don't know, but I know this. Compared to him, I'm insignificant, and I will trust him even if I don't see what he's doing. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. This brings freedom, praise God. Yes. So he who is here even now, he walks on the wind, he rides on the clouds, he makes the grass to grow, and he feeds all the cows. That's right. <laughs> to me, I love this. That he's, so, he's so intimately and personally involved in everything that he makes the blades of grass grow, mm -hmm. and he makes sure the cows eat. Who is this? The scripture goes on to tell us that he shuts the sea in with doors and he makes boundaries that the, the ocean cannot pass. It says he paints the clouds with his fingers and he raises the sun in the morning. He lights the moon at night and he walks the recesses of the ocean. Who is this? He walks on the bottom of the ocean. The scripture says that he has made the darkness of death and he alone can see inside of its darkness. What is this, guys? I think we need a grander vision of God. I know I do. I need a fresh vision of my God. He puts the store, the, I mean, he stores the snow in storehouses or in storage. He, call, he literally causes, the, the scriptures call him the father of rain, dew, and sleet. <laughs> this is crazy. So intimately involved in everything in this world. The scripture says that he tends to gardens that men will never see. That's just beautiful to me. You'll never even see the dandelion in some of these gardens, but he gives them just as much care as the ones that pass by in Disney World all day long. That's, right. That's character. Yeah. That's yeah. nature. Yeah. That is beyond anything mankind has ever known. So he puts wisdom in the hearts of men and understanding in their hearts. And all the while, a numberless multitude surrounds him, worshiping him night and day. He flung the stars, those heavenly flames. He counts their numbers. He knows their names. He gives flight to the eagle. He tightens the clam. He puts your tears in a bottle. He writes your name on his hand. <laughs> Who is this? Hallelujah. I, I say this because God wants to grab your mind. And he wants to pull it up to trust him. He wants to grab your affection and pull it up. So that we are those on the earth that are not actually here. We recognize our simultaneous dwelling and we are benefits to the earth because we live in the heavens. Yes. What are those heavens? The recognition of the beauty of the Lamb of God. Yes. The beauty of God. So he doesn't, just, he doesn't just live in these heights and this glorious power and all this. There is something else about him. That if that doesn't steal your heart away, everything we're talking about, that the scripture even says that he causes, he tells the lion to wait in the thicket when he's hunting so that he can show the lion how to hunt. Can you believe this? Who is this king of glory? He hunts through the lion. This is just crazy. He guides, the scripture says he guides the bear with her cubs. Shows her where to go. What is this? 
It's his divine wisdom implanted in everything. But if that doesn't steal your heart, let me tell you this. That that God became a man. Can you see the God man hanging there with his bloody matted hair, sinners passing without a care, the Pharisees in satisfaction stare? He, naked, he drips blood there, suffocating between the pair. He moves his palms tear. I'm increasingly aware of the fairest love beyond compare. Who is this? Who is this love that would love you so much that he would take your place? As, as Paul says in Galatians, he says, he gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us. <laughs> this is crazy. And it should steal the heart away every single day. See, because a, a twisted crown of thorns was pressed into his brow and blood flowed in his eyes, blinding him to all but the prize. This is humility personified. The blood of God, not realized. And though men love things that are deified, not a God that's crucified, but that's my God. He comes and he dies. Oh, precious blood of him who loved me so. His hands are nailed. His head hangs low. His body is broken. His back is slashed open. The splintering cross is soaked in blood. Oh, what love and a love of me. And I see his glory when his feet upon the sea. But never such glories when they're fastened to the tree. The breath of life breathes out his ghost with a dismayed angelic host. With a naked God upon the post. He's mostly red. Come down, they said. Man's faith is dead. But God bled. God bled for sin. Praise God. If this doesn't win the heart, if this doesn't make a sinner pass from death into life, I don't know what can. If this doesn't make angels sing in awe, I don't know what can. If this isn't worthy of daily meditation, and if this isn't worthy of dying for and living for, there is nothing worth dying for or living for. And I'm going to end with this story. I love this story because it's so clear. I don't know what you're going through here. I don't know what your life looks like. I don't know. We all have our problems. We all have situations going. We all have pressures. Everybody in this room in various ways. But there's a story of a little boy, and he is looking at his shadow on the ground, and he is doing everything he can to get away from his shadow. He's shaking and twisting. He's sweating and turning. No matter how much twisting, turning, and effort and striving he puts into it, he cannot detach himself from his shadow. His father sees what the little boy is doing, so he grabs his little boy by the shoulders and he turns him to face the sun. And the moment that the father turns the boy to face the sun, the, the boy realizes the shadow is gone. And I don't know what you're struggling to get away from. I don't know what it is that you have put so much effort in to try to detach yourself from. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's sin issues. Maybe it's self-consciousness in such deep ways. Maybe it's you're frustrated. Maybe you're offended. I don't know what it is that you're trying so hard to get away from, but you realize and you've been realizing you cannot, with all the efforts and striving, get away from this shadow of yours. But I tell you, let God turn you to face the sun and you'll see he casts behind you the shadow of your doubts, fears, unbelief, and all of these things. By looking unto Jesus, turning all of yourself towards Jesus, he will throw all these things behind you. You say, Eric, but what if I wake up the next day and the shadow's there? Turn and face the sun. What if during the day I find that the shadow's back? Turn and face the sun. We live looking unto Jesus. Yeah. We don't live be just because we look unto Jesus. We live by looking unto Jesus. Right. You consistently turn, consistently turn to look at the Lord and find over and over again that he saves just the same, perfectly every single time you yeah. can trust him. Praise God. Man, I feel faith in this room. Yes. I feel like God is doing a work by his spirit in my, in my mind and in my heart, even as I talk about these things. I pray you feel the same thing. Yeah. And I pray that you see love so great yeah. and so divine that it would steal your heart every single time. Yes. Praise God. So let's do this. Everybody just stand to your feet. We're done here, so just let's just, for this last little bit, just give all your attention to the Lord. 
The best thing you can do for yourself right now is forget the people to your right and your left and even get out of your own head about yourself and just turn your attention directly to this God that I have described for you in the scriptures who is so high and glorious and yet so low and lovely. And just with your own heart, and with your own words, just begin to tell him thank you. Yeah, tell him that there isn't anyone like this. Just ask him to forgive you for not giving him the attention he deserves. Tell him you want to love him. You want to love him. Yeah, with sincerity in your heart, just tell him, I love you, Lord. I realize I need you, and I ask you to forgive me for it. giving the attention you deserve to other things. Just ask him to steal your heart again. Just say, Lord, steal my heart again. And maybe you're here, and you haven't actually given your heart to this beautiful Jesus. Even right here, right now, you can just turn your heart and say, Here's my heart, Lord. I will follow you all of my days. I praise you. We're almost done. Just take a deep breath in. Breathe in. Breathe out. Just rest. Okay, just one more time. Breathe in. Breathe out. Just close with this song. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been thou forever will be great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy Hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings 
I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this. You're all I need. You're all I need. Jesus, you're all I need. You're all I need. You're all I need. Jesus, you're all I need.